fundraiser so uh, go out and find a good mud hole this week and come by and make those young people work amen and uh, there won't be a fee it'll be donations and so whatever your conscience will allow is uh, what we'll we'll charge so amen <laughs> amen uh, and then also on june the third from 10 to 2 uh, we'll be having another outreach uh, so i ask all of you that are able to do that we're just going out hanging door uh, hangers on doors we're not knocking doors and disturbing anybody but we're just hanging uh, door hangers on doors and uh, allowing them to gather the information they need that if they're hungry and they want to come see what's going on here at the church they have everything they need right there in their hand and we're not uh, disturbing their Saturday waking them up if they're sleeping in and we're just quickly just moving right along so I think we we did like 230 something houses uh, the last time we went out with about five or six of us, so uh, didn't stay but about an hour and a half. So uh, we're not trying to keep you all day, but from 10 to 12, if you'll come and help us with that, if you're able to do a little walking, uh, then come be a part of that. Uh, June the 7th, we're going to have uh, Brother Scott Smith in service with us, and then June the 11th, uh, we're going to have the ministry of Pastor Mark Harrelson from Mobile, Alabama, and we're excited about that. Amen. Stand together with us this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer today. We want to continue to pray for Jamie Sullivan. Uh, we want to pray for Sister Terry Darby, Brother Ronnie Kirkland, uh, Brother Nicholas Robbins, Sister Melissa Ratcliffe. And if you have a prayer need in the house today, lift your hand all across the building. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you today, and we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us. We're so glad today that we have a God that not only hears our prayers, but answers our prayers. You saw every need that was lifted before you this morning. You heard every name that was mentioned and every hand that was raised today. Father, we pray that you would touch every heart and every life, that you would minister to every need, that you would heal sickness and disease, that you would deliver those that are in bondage this morning, God, that you would make provision for those that are knee in need, that you would restore those that are hurting and broken this morning, and let your healing virtue flow, God, and I pray in this service this morning that your glory would fill this tabernacle today, God, and we're going to be careful that we give give you the honor and the glory and the praise for it and somebody shout in Jesus name amen put your hands together unto the Lord today amen you can be seated just for a few moments uh, of course you know tomorrow is Memorial Day and so we just want to take a, a few moments out of our service today to honor uh, the men and women that have given uh, their lives for the freedom of this country freedom is never free no matter if you're talking about spiritual freedom or our our physical freedom there's always a price to be paid and we're free in the spirit this morning because our Lord and Savior gave his life but we're free in America today because men and women were willing uh, to give and sacrifice their all for our freedom and I, I, I know that America has its problems today but you're looking at a pastor that still believes that we're living in the greatest nation on the face of the earth amen we're not perfect, but if you think America's bad, just go ahead and get you a plane ticket and hop over somewhere else and stay for a while. You'll be glad to. I, I noticed that the little basketball lady's now standing for the anthem after she spent about nine months in a Russian prison. Sometimes you don't know what you got until it's gone. Amen. And we're thankful this morning that we're living in a country where we can worship the Lord in this house. We don't have to worry about somebody coming in and taking our freedom and liberties away. But that didn't come without a price. And so we want to give honor today to the men and women that gave us that opportunity today. Amen.
The sight before us is that of a strong and good nation that stands in silence and remembers those who were loved and who in return loved their countrymen enough to die for them. Yet we must try to honor them, not for their sakes alone, but for our own. And if words cannot repay the debt we owe these men, surely with our actions we must strive to keep faith with them and with a vision that led them to battle and a final sacrifice. Our first obligation to them and ourselves is plain enough. The United States and the freedom for which it stands, the freedom for which they died, must endure and prosper. Their lives remind us that freedom is not bought cheaply. It has a cost. The willingness of some to give their lives so that others might live never fails to evoke in us a sense of wonder and mystery, and how they must have wished, in all the ugliness that war brings, that no other generation of young men to follow would have to undergo that same experience. As we honor their memory today, let us pledge that their lives, their sacrifices, their valor shall be justified and remembered for as long as God gives life to this nation. And let us also pledge to do our utmost to carry out what must have been their wish, that no other generation of young men will ever have to share their experiences and repeat their sacrifice. today that have served in the military and are currently serving uh, we appreciate your willingness uh, to, to sacrifice as well and we don't take that for granted and as long as I'm pastor of this assembly we're going to make sure that that's an honor that we give and I appreciate that so very dearly amen let's stand together in this house as we honor the one that gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom in this place in the spirit today and that's our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ let's worship and exalt him in this place today
you give the Lord some praise in the house today. Amen. We want our ushers to come and receive our Sunday morning uh, tithe and offering as we worship the Lord today with our giving and our worship today. Amen. Holy 
with the Holy Ghost. Like a raging fire burning my soul. Baptize me with the Holy Ghost. 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 When the sun begins to beam down on the earth, an evaporation, water from the earth ascends into the heavens. And then when those clouds gather that water and they get so heavy they can't hold it no more, then the rain begins to fall. Well, guess what? In the spiritual realm, it happens the same way. That when the S-O-N begins to shine down on the earth and praise begins to go up into the heavens until God says, I can't handle it no more. I got to come down where they're at because he inhabits the praises of his people. Come on, who wants the S-O-N to shine down in this place today and walk among us? Who wants the Alpha and the Omega? Who wants a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost in the house today? Baptize me, baptize me, Jesus, with the Holy Ghost. I shall have power, your worship soul. Satan is busy to try to turn me around, but I'm determined to stand my ground, but I can do it, I can do it, baptize me with the Holy Ghost. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord. They were filled with expectation, waiting on the promise of the Lord. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came like a rushing mighty wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So was the room they were sitting in. Baptize me, Jesus. Baptize me, Jesus, with the Holy Ghost. I shall have power. Your words are so. Satan is busy to try to turn me around. But I'm determined to stand my ground. But I can do it. Hallelujah. I can do it. Baptize me with 
the Holy Ghost. Well, on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord. They were filled with expectation, waiting on the promise of the Lord. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came like a rushing mighty wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So what the room they were setting in. Baptized with Jesus. Baptized with Jesus. With the Holy Ghost. Your works are so straight on his busy trying to turn around But I'm determined to stand my ground But I can't do it I can't do it Baptize me with the Holy Ghost in the mirror and say, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, don't you dare give up, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, don't you dare give up, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, don't you dare give up, hang in there, hang in there. Hang in there, don't you let it up. Hang in there, hang in there, 
hanging Thought you never give up so, Sometimes you're the prayer You're in the prayer closet And it don't seem like your prayers are going any higher than the ceiling And the enemy's just telling you Just go on, stop praying You're not doing no good You know what you need to do? Hang in there Hang in there Hang in there Sometimes you're in the house of God on a Sunday morning and you got up and it seemed like from the moment you woke up this morning all the way until you walked in the door, it was a struggle. And you're in the house of God and you want to lift up your hands, but they feel heavy. You want to jump, but they feel heavy. You, you want to lift up your voice, but there's a heaviness. You know what you got to do? You got to hang in there. You hang in there. Hang in there. I don't know who it's for today. Don't you? But I just feel like telling somebody Hang in there Hang in there Don't you ever give up Hang in there Hang in there Hang in there Don't you ever give up Hang in there Hang in there, hang in there, don't you ever give up. Maybe, maybe there's somebody in the house this morning. You're doing the best you can for living for God, but it seems like you're like the Apostle Paul when he said, those things that I would do, I do not. And those things that I would not do, those things I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. You want me to tell you what you need to do? Don't you ever give up. You got to hang in there, hang in there. Hang in there, don't you ever give up. Hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, don't you ever give up. Hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, don't you ever give up. Hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, don't you ever give up. is not to the swift neither is the battle to the strong but Jesus said he that will endure till the end the same shall be saved amen anybody glad got the Holy Ghost in the house this morning anybody glad you got the Holy Ghost in the house this morning amen once again we want to welcome all of our guests to the house of the Lord today. We're so delighted you chose to be in service with us today and we want you to just feel right at home and worship the Lord with us. Now, I, I tell the home folks around here, uh, preaching's kind of like pulling a wagon. <clears throat> the more people pulling, the faster the wagon moves. And so if y'all let me pull the wagon by myself today, we might be here for a while. They saw I had three waters up there and they said, Pastor must be planning on preaching a long time today. Well, it just depends on how much I had to pull by myself. But if you can hear with me and kind of ag me on a little bit, you know, and amen me a little while and clap a little bit, you know, I, I seem to do a little bit better. So, amen, if you want, me, you want me to do better today, help me a little bit. Praise God. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of John chapter 1. Thank John chapter 1. St. John chapter 1 verse 11 said he came unto his own talking about Jesus and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he power somebody say power power, power for what power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day, somebody say the day. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all in one accord and in one place. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody say all. 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 Now I want you to understand who all is. Sure enough all is the twelve disciples. 
minus Judas, of course, but they replaced him with Matthias. So all 12 disciples was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. And there were some other people there, because the Bible says in just a little further reading that there was 120 there. But it wasn't 12 that spoke in tongues. It was all 120. At least when I was in school, all meant all. Amen. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want you to pay attention to two things in this saying of Scripture. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come. A day is an event that you can mark on the calendar. Okay? So there was an event that was markable on the calendar that was happening. And then there was this other thing. And so I, I want to preach to you today with the help of the Lord. Pentecost, is it a religion or an experience? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we want you to, we want you to just move in the remainder of this service today. God, we can't do anything without you today. I'm asking today that you would anoint these lips of clay that I would speak everything that you desire to be spoken in this house. But Lord, I'm also asking for you to anoint the ear of the hearer and their mind that they would have an understanding and their heart that it would be open and receptive so that God, your word and your spirit can accomplish what you desire to do in this place today. And that God, there would be somebody that walks out of this place this morning that would not only know Pentecost as a religion, but they would come to know Pentecost as an experience today. We pray for the Holy Holy Ghost to fall in this service this morning uh, and for you to have your sovereign and divine way in this place uh, and we're going to give you the honor and the praise for it. Somebody put your hands together unto the Lord and give him some praise in the house this morning. Amen. And you can be seated. I want you to understand that in this setting of scripture, Pentecost had two very different meanings to different people. You see, all throughout the city of Jerusalem on that day, there were people preparing to celebrate the religious feast of Pentecost. It was a joyful time of thanksgiving unto the Lord that came 50 days after the Passover or the time when the angel of death passed over the homes of Israel that was covered by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you this morning too that if Pentecost is going to come to visit you, it's only going to come to visit those whose house has been covered by the blood of the Lamb. I can assure you of one thing. You will never receive the Holy Ghost until you find an altar of repentance in your life. Somebody say amen. Hey man, something's got to die in your life for you to have a Pentecost. But Pentecost came after the Feast of Weeks, which was a feast that was seven weeks long, seven days of course. Hey Amen. We used to have revivals like that. Y'all don't get scared now. So we used to have revivals like that that were seven days long. Not two services or three days, but seven days long. Seven weeks. So for 49 days, they had a feast that was a joyful celebration of the harvest. It was a jubilant feast filled with music and dancing. And then as soon it was, as it was ended, Pentecost began because Pente means 50. So on that fateful day in Jerusalem on one side of town, Jews were celebrating the religious ritual and feast of Pentecost. But in an upper room, there was 120 souls that was gathered together with the promise of God that would receive the power of Pentecost. You see, that's the difference. You can have religion or you can have a relationship. On one side of town, there were people going through the motions of a religion. But on the other side of town, in an upper room, there 
there were some people that had been walking with the one that others were just talking about. There were some people that had been physical relationship with the one that others knew a head knowledge of. They knew about Jesus, but they didn't even recognize him when he showed up. And on one side of Jerusalem, they were celebrating a feast called Pentecost. But on the other side of Jerusalem, in an upper room, there was a group of people that had a promise for God that they had relationship with. Luke 24 and 49, Jesus speaking to his disciples said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until. How long is that? Until. Until what? Until you be endued with power from on high. Well, guess what they, where they were in the upper room. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, The former treaties have I made of the office of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day which he was taken up that he through the Holy Ghost had given suggestions. Oh, it's not a suggestion? No. It said he had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, he, ye have heard of me. Now, this is the thing that was always interesting to me. A hundred and twenty Receive the Holy Ghost. But there's another saying in Scripture that says that he showed himself to above 500. My question is, where'd the other 380 go? I got a feeling. See, because that's the thing with this Holy Ghost thing. This being spiritual thing sometimes takes a little time. Sometimes you've got to wait just a little bit. Come on. Sometimes you've got to grab a hold to a promise of God and hold on to it until it manifests itself. And it may not come today. And it may not come. That's why the Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, I used to read that scripture and I didn't understand it because that didn't make any sense to me because it seemed like to me it was contradicting itself. Because if faith is the substance, substance... This water bottle right here is substance. I can see it. I can touch it. I can get a hold of it. But it says faith is the substance of things hoped for. If I'm hoping for a bottle of water, that means I don't have it in my possession. And then it says, and it's the evidence of things not seen. That would be like you walking into a courtroom and trying to plead a case. And say, Your Honor, I have evidence. And he says, Well, I'd like to see your evidence. Well, you can't see it. <laughs> and so I, I, I was confused one time, among another a lot of times. And I said, God, I don't understand. You're going to have to break this down to me because I'm not getting it. And he said, What faith does is faith reaches into the Spirit and grabs a hold of a promise. And you possess that promise in your spirit until it manifests itself in the tangible. That means you get a hold of it and you hang in there and don't give up. Hallelujah. That you stagger not at the promises of God. But you're like Abraham that believed that he that promised is able to perform it. you got to stand on the promises until your promise finally shows up. You can't give up. you got to hang in there. You got to wait. You got to tarry. Amen. You got to trust that the one that gave you the promise is going to do what he said. Because the scripture says he's not man that he should lie on the son of man that he should repent. That every promise in him is yea and every promise is amen. And he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father's put in his power. See, that's, that's where we get in trouble. 
is we got the promise, but we worried about the timing and the season of the promise. That's not your business. Your business is to hang on to the promise until he gets ready to supply the need. Amen. Let him worry about the season and you just worry about keeping the faith until what he promised shows up. He said, that's not for you to know, but you shall receive power. Somebody say power. power. Explosive. That word is dunamis, dynamite. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. For what? So you can speak in tongues on Sunday? Get a little goosebump, do that, run up and down a little every while, dance a little bit? No. No, there's a purpose for your power. You shall be witnesses unto me. You see, you can read in a book about somebody, and you can tell somebody head knowledge about somebody. But it's a different level when you're walking in personal relationship with them. And Jesus said, I'm going I'm to send power upon you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you more than just head knowledge. I'm going to give you spirit knowledge of who I am. I'm going to let you feel me living inside of you. I'm with you now, but I'm going to go away that I can come again and be in you. What? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And he said, you can be a witness unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and to Mary and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts chapter 2 was the birth of the New Testament church. And may I tell you this morning, the church was not born in a synagogue while performing a religious ritual, but it was born in an upper room at an altar of the heart that was hungry, searching and seeking and waiting for the promise of God. It was born in the fire and the power of the Spirit. You know where we run into trouble in this generation? We wait on the preacher to bring the fire. But if we're going to follow the pattern of Acts chapter 2, it was the praying that brought the, brought the power that gave the preaching what it needed. May I tell you, it still works that way today. That's why I push pre-service prayer so hard. Because I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to flow in a spirit that's already moving than to get in here and hook up to a heavy wagon that's sitting still. Amen. We all got a part to play in this thing today. Amen. Now, if, you, if, you, if this is just about religion to you, then it's fine. You can come in. You ain't got to pray. All you got to do is just come in, sit on your little chair, and warm up your little however many inches you can cover on that 21-inch on that chair, and you just warm up your little spot and give us your little nod here and there and act like you're in an auction and wave your finger every once in a while. You don't have to participate too much in it. And that's why people like being religious because religion don't cost you nothing. It don't cost you nothing. There's no sacrifice that's required with religion other than I showed up and I fulfilled my little obligation and my duty and, and I, they checked my name on the roll this morning so now I can go live how I want to the rest of the week. But if I remember right, this religious folks is who Jesus had the most problem with. Matter of fact, every, it wasn't the sinners and publicans Jesus was rebuking most of the time. You know what it was? It was them old high-minded, self-righteous, dead, dry, plucked up by the roots religious folks that knew about God, but they didn't know God. Oh, they knew about him. They could quote you every scripture pertaining the coming of the Messiah that you wanted to quote. But when he showed up, they didn't even recognize him. You know why? Because he didn't fit in their little religious mold. He wasn't in the synagogues with them every Sunday going through their religious rituals. And he showed up in the synagogue from time to time. But it was usually to give some clear instruction to some crooked ways. But where you find Jesus on most occasions is at the, at the seat of sinners. Showing, hey, you can have a relationship with me. See, that's, that's, that's what Calvary was all about. The scripture doesn't say Jesus came to seek and save those that was lost. The scripture says Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Those are people, but that is a thing. 
So what's the thing? What is it that was so important to God that He came and robed Himself in flesh? Of course your soul's important today. But your soul is not of that. It's of those. But God understood if I can get the that back in place, the those will be saved. You know what the that is? The that is the relationship that God had with mankind in the garden before sin entered in. And every day in the cool of the evening, God walked through the garden and talked with Adam and walked with Adam. But sin broke that communion and fellowship. You see, you can't have a, a regular relationship with a holy God and it not filter over into your unholy life, transform, transforming you into His holiness. His holiness is so great that you're either going to be transformed or you got to leave. Come on, I, I, I went and preached. Uh, when I started prison ministry out in Texas, one of the chaplains come to me and he said, hey, I just want to tell you, you know, there's a lot of these guys come up in here. They ain't really come for church. They're coming in here to meet with this one, meet with that one, do mischievous things. I said, chaplain, I don't know what kind of church you used to having around here, but when the Holy Ghost gets moving in here, it's going to get so hot that they got to get right or get out. They can't stay. Come on. It's kind of like that serpent that was in the, in the wood pile that when Paul started that fire, he finally got the fire so hot that the viper had to come on out of there. Come on, that's the way it is. When you start having good old Holy Ghost church, it gets so hot that sin either has to get right or get out. Amen. And so... We see that prior to Acts chapter 2, there were people in Jerusalem that had a doctrine. But after the Holy Ghost fell, we see a church that had a demonstration. Hear me today. We can call ourselves apostolic all we want or Pentecostal or whatever label you want to put on it. But if all we got is a doctrine and there's never a demonstration of the power, then all we are is another religious organization. Hear me. The Apostle Paul looked at the church of Galatia and said, Oh foolish Galatians, uh, who hath bewitched you that having begun in the Spirit, you were born in the fire. You were born with the Holy Ghost. You were born with a demonstration of the power. But are you now made perfect in your flesh has your religious routine and protocol now become sufficient no I say not what is this Holy Ghost we're talking about Romans 1 and 16 says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek what's the gospel the gospel is the death the burial, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Come on, I heard one gospel singer say one time, he said, we don't sing gospel music no, no more. He said, we sing inspirational music. He said, because if you ain't singing about the death, the burial, the resurrection, or the second coming, you ain't singing the gospel. Well, that's height, but it's right. Amen. Come on, we've tried to whitewash this thing so much so it'll be palatable to everybody that we want to remove the blood out. But if you remove the blood out of it, you don't have any salvation. Because the old song says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Romans 10 and 14 said, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that bring the gospel of peace and bring good tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed in our report? So faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8 says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, I've talked to people and tried to tell them about God. Well, I, I talk to the Lord all the time. That's good. I believe in Jesus. That's a great start. Start. But you ain't saved.
Just because you believe. Well, how do you know? Because I got Bible. Because the Bible says, Thou believest there is one God, James 2, 19. Thou doest well, the devil also believe. But they ain't saved. Matter of fact, they believe and go a little step further than some people. They believe and tremble. Some people believe and just keep on sinning. Because there's no fear. That's the problem with this generation is we don't have any fear of God anymore. I'm afraid we're too far removed from the last Ananias and Sapphira. Amen. I, I'm afraid we're so far removed from the last bunch of chorus that now we got people that they don't have any problem rising up against the man of God and talking to him any old way. Hmm? Well, that's the generation we're living in today. I'm glad there ain't none of those in here today. Amen. But they're, they're there. They're in the world. I've seen them with my own eyes. I was, I've seen people like so foolish in the house of God and toward the man of God, I was thinking, my Lord, somebody's going to fall dead any minute. Thank God for mercy that they did. But I was sure expecting them to. Why? Because I, I got too much fear to do something like that. I still believe that the Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets know. I still believe that. And I don't believe that just applies to you not touching me. I believe if you got the Holy Ghost and you bear the name of Jesus, I don't need to have my hands on you either. Amen. Because we're all a part of the body of Christ. And we got to be careful how we handle one another. Well, that's a message for another day. 1 Peter 4 and 17. For time has come that judgment. What? Judgment. Must begin... Where? At the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? See, it's one thing for you to believe the gospel, and it's another thing for you to obey the gospel. Amen? In the plan of salvation today, if we're going to obey the gospel, you, want, you may ask the question, how can we die, be buried and resurrected like Christ? We die in repentance, Mark 6 and 12. They went out and preached that men should repent. Luke 5, 32. I came out to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 13 and 5. But nay, I tell you, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Acts 17 and 30. And at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He said that there was a time that God winked at ignorance. But now. Somebody say, but now. Now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, let me break this thing, repent down, because there's people confused about what repentance is in this generation. We got people in this generation that thinks repent means that you're sorry that you got caught, but you're not really sorry that you did it. And so they think repent means you can come down to the altar and tell God that you're sorry and shed a few tears and you can go back out and keep doing it. Because after all, doesn't it say where sin doth abound, grace does much more abound? Yeah, it does. But it also says, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And it also says that when the angel of the Lord came and brought salutations to Mary that she was going to have a son and they're going to call his name Jesus, it didn't say, for he shall save his people in their sin. It says, for he shall save his people from their sin. How do you think those Hebrew children would have took it that day if Moses would have showed up and said, Hey, fellas, y'all been laboring over here for 400 years in Egypt, and you know, y'all been filling them whips on your back, and you've been out in this hot sun laboring. God's going to deliver you, but you got to stay here in Egypt and keep on making bricks and getting beat on the back. That don't sound like deliverance to me. Huh. No. Why? Because deliverance is when you come out. Come on, if somebody's coming to you and preaching to you a gospel that tells you can, you can stay in and be delivered, go on and mark them as a liar. Because that's what they are, as a liar. If they're telling you you can continue in your sin and be saved, liar, liar, your soul's going to be on fire. Amen. It says, at the time of ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. 
2 Peter 3 and 9, The Lord is not lack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But it's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. But this is the key to you not perishing. But that all should come to repentance. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. What do you mean, Paul, you die daily? How can you die every day? I find an altar of repentance where I crucify my will. See, that's what, that's what repentance is about, is your will dying out to His will. See, you can either have the spirit of Lucifer that said, I will, I will, I will, I will. Or you can have the spirit of Jesus that says, not my will. But thy will be done. Which one you'll have the spirit of today? Burial is baptism. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism unto death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we should walk in the newness of life. So we're buried with him by baptism. Mark 1 and 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You know what? That message is what many people are preaching today. Repent, believe on the Lord, and be baptized. Well, some of them don't even say you have to be baptized. They just say you repent and believe on the Lord. Well, that's a good start, but that's not all the message. And one old preacher said to me one time, he said, A half-truth is a whole lie. Repent and believe on the Lord's a good start, but that's not all of it. And that's not even all the message that John the Baptist preached. John the Baptist preached, repent, believe on the Lord, and there's one coming after me that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So if you go preach what John preached, at least preach all that John preached. And add the Holy Ghost in there. Don't be telling people that foolishness, oh, that's not for you today. Well, you better get your Bible out because Acts 2.39 says, For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And the last I read, you can't come to God until He calls you. No man can come to the Father except he first be drawn of the Spirit. So if there is a desire on the inside of you to get right with God, it's because God called you. So that means the promise is to you if you're willing to repent. Matthew 3 and 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me, John the Baptist speaking, is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mark 1 and 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Luke 3.16, John answered and said unto them, Oh, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I come, with the latches of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John 1.33, and I knew him not, John speaking, but he that sent me to baptize with water... The same said unto me, whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. You see, John was preparing the way for Jesus to baptize us with the Holy Ghost by pe preaching repentance and baptism for the remission of sins. But he wasn't just re preaching repentance and baptism for remission of sins, he was preaching get the Holy Ghost too. And so like today, the plan of salvation is repent. And the preacher baptizes you, but God is the one that fills you with the Holy Ghost. If you obey the gospel of repentance and baptism only, then you're just a very dead man. And the Bible, doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that we're dead. We're a dead church. The Bible says that we're lively stones built together. Come on. The Bible says that the enemy come but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come that you may have life. Yes, there is a part of you that's got to die. 
But then there's a resurrection that God wants to have in your life. He don't want you, he don't want, he wants the old man to die, but he wants to raise you up in the newness of life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things have become new. John 7, 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, he that believeth on me, what about it? As the scripture has said, that means you believe on the Lord and be unscriptural in your belief. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, I just think, well, that's, that's well, that and five cents will make a nickel. I'll let you mathematicians catch up with that in a minute. I just think, well, that's fine, but what's the Bible say? He that believeth on me as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall, somebody say shall, not might, not maybe, but shall flow rivers of living water. What's that talking about? Keep reading. This spake he of the Spirit, that they which believe on him should. If you're a believer in Jesus, you should receive the Holy Ghost. Well, wait a minute. Somebody taught me that the minute I repented, I believed I got the Holy Ghost. Well, then they taught you wrong. Because it says that if you believe on Him, you should receive the Holy Ghost, but it didn't say you did. You should, but you might not. It just depends on if you keep on believing until. Huh? See, everybody wants to go to the Romans road of salvation in Romans 10. First of all, let me break a few things down for you. It was written to the church at Rome, which is people that had already received the salvation experience. So he wasn't telling them how to be saved. He was affirming the salvation they had already received. He wasn't preaching to sinners on the plan of salvation. He was affirming and reassuring the church of their plan of salvation, which they'd already received. And guess what that plan was? It's the one that's found in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, that Romans wrote of salvation that want people walk down says, with the, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. I'm not scared of that scripture because I know what it means. With the heart man believeth. That E-T-H means there's a continual process of believing. The man believeth unto righteousness. That means there's a process of believing until you obtain righteousness. Why? Because your righteousness is filthy rags. And so if my righteousness is filthy rags, how do I become righteous? You become righteous by taking on His Spirit of righteousness or His Holy Spirit. You get His righteousness when the Holy Ghost, and then it says, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's not just opening your mouth saying, I believe in Jesus. Oh, no. Because 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, I think, says, for with the mouth, uh, no, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 3 I believe says with with uh, uh, no man speaking by the Spirit called Jesus the curse, and no and and no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. See, He can't be Lord of your life if He ain't in your life. How can He be ruler of a kingdom that He's not in? See, if you ain't got the Holy Ghost, you're the king of this kingdom. But when He comes in. Then the King of kings and the Lord of lords has showed up in the house. And now you can say he's Lord of your life because he's actually in your life. And so if you're a believer, the Bible says you should receive the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus is not yet glorified. But let me let you in on a bulletin. Our opening text lets us know that the Holy Ghost has been given. I have people tell me, well, you, it's not for you today. Too late. I done got it. I 
didn't get the bulletin, I guess, because I got it. I got it. Something about the power of the Holy Ghost. I can't always explain everything about it, but I can tell you this, I got it. When I got it, I didn't know a lot about it, but I still got it. You know what I had to do to get it? I had to repent. I had to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and God gave me the Holy Ghost. And there's some other people in the house today. You got it too. Amen. And the gospel of the resurrection is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is life. The Holy Ghost is power to get up. The Holy Ghost is the resurrection to the newness of life. The gospel is the power of God of salvation. But we must obey all the gospel. We got to die, we got to be buried, and we got to be raised as a new creature. Romans 8 and 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Remember I told you, you got to believe unto righteousness. So if Christ be in you, the body dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life under righteousness. See, I'm not just telling you something I made up in my head. It's in the book. You have my notes afterwards if you want. It's there. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. Romans 6 and 3, Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Romans th uh, Galatians 3.27 For as many of you have been baptized in the Christ have put on Christ. Ephesians 4 and 5 says there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. And that baptism contains two elements of water and spirit. Acts 2.38 Peter said unto them, or John 3 and 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, accept. Are there any exceptions to the word accept? No. That's what the word accept means. This is the only way. See, Jesus is not just a way. He's the only way. Amen. Amen. I, I've heard some people say, Oh, we all believe in the same God. If you ain't calling Him Jesus, we don't believe in the same God. Come on. Amen. Y'all quiet on me today. I should have got an amen on that. I said, if you ain't calling his name Jesus, we don't believe in the same God. Amen. 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 Jesus is not a way to heaven. He's the way to heaven. He's not just the way to heaven. When you get there, he's the door in. He said, I'm the way. And then he said, I'm the door. And if you try to enter in any other way by the door, he said, then you're a thief and a robber. You're going to be cast out. It's in the book. Except the man be born of water and of spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the washing away of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not only do you need the Holy Ghost in order to obey the gospel, you need the Holy Ghost to be born again. But you can't even say that Jesus is the Lord of your life without the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. Now concerning spiritual gifts, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away these dumb idols as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit called Jesus accursed, and no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Romans 8 and 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Pastor, can I make it to heaven without the Holy Ghost? I'll let you take that scripture and you decide for yourself. I'll let you take that in John 3, 5 and Romans 8 and 9 and you figure out what you think it might be saying. But the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But the good thing is, is you can have it. You can get it if you want it. You just got to want it. Amen. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of adoption by which we become the sons of God, Romans 8, 15. The Holy Ghost is power from on high in Acts 1 and 8. The Holy Ghost is the comforter in John 14 and 16, 14, 26, 15 and 26. 
in John 16 and 7. The Holy Ghost is our teacher. John 14 and 26. It's the Spirit that brings us revelation in the Word of God. The Holy Ghost is the power to give up, get up again. It's the Spirit of resurrection. The Holy Ghost is an intercessor. Romans 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit, capital S, means the Holy Ghost, also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought. Anybody ever been in that place where you've got problems so big in your life you don't even know what to ask for to get out? Good thing is, is you've got the Holy Ghost. You don't have to know. He does. And the Bible says, But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It means it's going to begin to pray for you and you ain't going to understand what it's asking, but God does. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, I want to stop right here and help somebody with this, because some people think that speaking in tongues is just exclusively one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. It's not exclusively. It is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. But it's not exclusively. Speaking in other tongues is the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. They all spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter number 2, if you go to Acts chapter number 10, the first place that Gentiles received the Holy Ghost, they knew that they had received the Holy Ghost. How? Well, the Bible says, for they heard them speak in tongues. So the first time the Jews got the Holy Ghost, they all spoke with tongues. The first time the Gentiles got the Holy Ghost, they all spoke in tongues. And in Acts chapter 19, when the disciples of John the Baptist come to Paul, and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They were already believers. They had already repented. They had already been baptized for the remission of sins. They said, we don't even know where there would be a Holy Ghost. And he said, well, what, under what then were you baptized? They said, under John's baptism. For John verily baptized under repentance. Well, Paul didn't, Paul didn't scold them and say, you old ignorant people, don't you know? But no, he just said, hey. Okay, fellas, that's a good start. You've got repentance taken care of. Now let's rebaptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And so he rebaptized them in Jesus' name. And the Bible says, and when he laid hands on them, they did receive the Holy Ghost. Did you make that connection? Because there's some people that say that as soon as you believe in Jesus, you got the Spirit of God. They were already believers, but they didn't have the Holy Ghost. But when Paul baptized them in Jesus' name and laid hands and prayed, on, prayed for them, the Bible says, and the Holy Ghost fell on them. And guess what they did too? They spoke in tongues. You know, I was praying for the Holy I was praying one day. I wasn't even praying for the Holy Ghost. I didn't even know that I didn't have it. I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't know anything about anything when I started trying to walk this way. And so I had repented. But I didn't have the Holy Ghost, but I didn't know that I didn't have the Holy Ghost. So I'm one, day, one day I'm in a church service and my heart is heavy for another family member that was lost. And, and I'm just crying out to God with everything I got. And while I'm over there crying out to God for my family member, my aunt's on one side and other little sister's on the other side. And they, they got me swaying while I'm praying. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden while I'm praying, this funny language comes out of my mouth. I didn't even know that I was supposed to speak in tongues. But God filled me with the Holy Ghost, and guess what I did when I didn't even know I was supposed to did it? I spoke in tongues. So you got the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. You got the gift of tongues, which there should be an interpreter if somebody else is obeying their part of it and, and brings the interpretation. But then you got this spirit of intercession that the Bible says that the Spirit maketh intercession for you with groanings cannot be uttered. And then it says, No man understandeth it but God. And so don't get confused about that. And it's the Holy Ghost that's going to get us out of here in the rapture. Amen. Romans 8 and 10, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Holy Ghost is something all believers should have. In the last day, the great day of the feast, John 7, 37, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, 
that they that re, uh, believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Mark 16 and 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Didn't say they were saved. Why? Because they ain't got the Holy Ghost yet. You've only got one part of your baptism accomplished. You've got the water part done, but you ain't got the spirit part done. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. There should be some things going on in a believer's life. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. That don't mean you quit cussing. By the way, you should quit cussing. But just because you quit cussing, that's not a new tongue. That's just a cleaned up old tongue. New tongue is when you speak something you ain't never spoke before. That's what's going to happen to believers. Amen. And so Paul asked the question in Acts 19. He said, how have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, Holy Ghost, what's that? We don't even know what that is. And the Bible says, that Paul rebaptized them, and then of course they'd already repented. So I told you earlier, we can pray for you around here until my face turns blue like my suit. But if you ain't repented, you ain't getting it. You got to repent. And let me tell you this: true repentance is when you're surrendering your life to God, and you're saying, "I no longer own myself. I'm not my own. I understand that I." I owed a debt to sin that I didn't have the power to pay. But he paid a debt that he didn't owe. And it was my debt. And so I owe him my life. And so true repentance is when you surrender your will to his will. And say, God, whatever it is that pleases you and makes you happy is what I want to do with this life. And so... In the military, they used the word to repent. And the word to repent in the military means you're an about face. You was walking this way, but now you've turned around. You was living your life one way and doing your own thing, but now you've turned in a new direction. And you're living a completely different life. Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. We, we baptized little Anya the other day in the name of Jesus Christ. Cutest thing. And I, I got to share this because it was so cute. So when she was in the water, I said, Now, Anya, I said, have you repented? She said, Yes, sir. I said, Because we've got to repent before we're baptized. He said, she, uh, she said, I have. And so, you know, she was kind of scared be baptized by ourselves. So I said, Anya, would it make you feel better if Pastor got in there with you? She said, yes. And so I, I just shucked my coat and my mic and my wallet and my shoes. And we crawled over in the tank with her. And we baptized her in Jesus' name. Well, Sister Katie, Sister Katie said that when they was in the bathroom back there getting dry clothes on, Anya said, Pastor got in there with me. I sure hope he repented first. <laughs> I did. I did. But it's amazing that that was just in her little mind. Pastor got in here with me. And even though he wasn't getting baptized today, I sure hope he repented if he's going to be in here with me. You got to repent. And then you need to be buried. Because we don't leave dead people above ground. They've got to be buried. And let me tell you this sprinkling water on you is not buried. Sprinkling is not in the Bible. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptismo, which means to submerge or to go under. You don't put a dead man on top of the ground and throw a handful of dirt on him and say, okay, you're buried. Boy, that'd be a stinking situation. 
It's a stinking situation too if you repent and you don't get buried in that name of Jesus Christ. Because when you take on that name in baptism, that's where the blood's applied. Yeah. The blood's applied at baptism. You find that typology in the Old Testament when that priest would bring that lamb to that altar, that brazen altar, and he would cut that lamb and he'd catch that blood. He's doing the service to that lamb and he's getting blood all over his hands. And the Lord told those priests, He said, except you wash, you'll perish. And so the Bible said that that priest would go to that brazen laver that was made out of polished brass that was mirror-like. And he would look at himself in that brass to see if any blood had splattered up here. And of course he had blood on his hands. And as he was there at that laver, when he stuck those bloody hands down in that water, that blood mingled in that water. The blood's still in the water if the name of Jesus is spoken. If Jesus ain't spoken, it's not there. Because neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. His name is the saving name. His name is where the blood's applied. You got buried with Him in baptism. He don't want you to stay a dead man. He wants to give you the newness of life. I can tell you today, but the only thing I regret about receiving the Holy Ghost, I only got one regret, Brother Price. Just one. I regret that I waited till I was 15 years old to get it. That's the only regret. I, I wouldn't. One of my kids got it at five. Another one got it at seven. I think maybe two of them got it at five. Five, seven, eight. Thank you only regret I have is that I didn't get it at 5, 7, and 8. That I, I, I waited till I was 15. But you know what? I'm glad I got it. And I'm glad I still have it. I'm glad I still have it. Stand with me this morning. So this is Pentecost Sunday. And today... Even today, there are people that are celebrating the religious holiday of Pentecost, Shavuot. But in all other places, on, in other parts of the world, houses like today, there's people that's having the experience of Pentecost. You, if you don't, if you haven't had that experience today, you can get it. You can receive the gift. It's a gift. You don't earn it. No good merits that you do, other than just repent. Just repent. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What are you going to be filled with? the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost the spirit of righteousness the Holy Ghost so if you're in the house today and you've never repented of your sin truly repented and asked the Lord see there's a lot of people that want Jesus to be their Savior but not their Lord he can't be your Savior if he's not your Lord because Jesus is either going to be the Lord of all or not Lord at all. He's not going to be a part-time ruler in your life. He's not going to operate as a part-time Savior in your life. you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. you got to give Him all today. So with every head is bowed and every eye is closed in this place this morning, you're in this house today you've heard this word today and you know that you're not where you need to be with God you've, maybe you're here today and you've repented of your sins and you've been baptized in Jesus name but you've never received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues 
What a wonderful day to get the Holy Ghost like today. You can have it today. He's still pouring out the Holy Ghost. Maybe you're here today and you've repented of your sins, been baptized in Jesus' name. And you've received the Holy Ghost, but maybe, maybe you've let that fire grow cold and it's been a while since you've had a renewing or refreshing. Guess what? You can be renewed in the Holy Ghost this morning. Come on, the Bible says that there were ten virgins in the Bible when five were five and five were foolish. Five were wise and five were foolish. And the difference between the wise and foolish, all of them were virgins. But the difference between the wise and the foolish is the foolish allowed the oil to go out of their lamp. That's symbolic of the Holy Ghost. You can get to living in this world for so long that if you're not taking care and maintaining your walk with God, you can become carnal. That oil will begin to run low in your life and you need that renewing and that refreshing of the Spirit. You can get that today. I'm opening the altars this morning to everybody that'd like to come and say, God, I just want you to let that power of the Holy Ghost breathe on me this morning. I need a move of the Holy Ghost in my life. I need a refreshing of the Spirit in my life. For God, I want to receive the Holy Ghost for the very first time in my life today. You can have it on the Pentecost Sunday.